Hi, I'm Jan Ozer. I'm talking today with Zoe Louis, who is the co-founder and CEO of Vision Alert and a genuine one name compression celebrity. There's Colleen, there's Fabio, and then there's Zoe. And everybody knows who you're talking about when you say that just one name. And we're here to talk about how AI is boosting the efficiency of Vision Euler's codecs, which include AV1, HEVC, and H.264. Thanks for joining me, Zoe. Well, thank you for having me here, Jen. I really appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure. So what products and services do Vision Euler sell? Yeah, we basically, as you just mentioned, we basically focus on video compression technologies. So we have three encoder focused, AV1, HEVC, and AVC H.264. So what we mainly deliver are software-based, on-premise, uh, based software encoder solution streaming. And on the other side, we also provide a cloud-based VOD RTC and live solutions. So actually with our core encoder as a differentiator, but we also at the same time provide end-to-end -end solutions. So that's okay. what we offer at this time. When you say end-to-end -end on the cloud, does that mean CMS and player or is it just the transcoding? Yes, on the center side. So we take, for example, the ingest stream and then do the transcoding. We can do also the packaging and then streaming out uh, to okay. push to the customer side. So right now we mainly focus on the center side. Okay. And how is AI incorporated into each of these products or services? Yeah, that's, uh, I think nowadays people talk about AI a lot. So we actually, our core, technologies, like you just mentioned, stay with the encoding. So that's compression. So I would say nowadays, uh, compression still focus on the traditional better quality, smaller size with smaller bit rate, as well as the faster speed. But we want to add two more factors down here. So besides quality, bit rate, and encoding speed, there's also latency. So there's a lot of low latency application, even for VOD, people talk about like the how to reduce the turn run time, turn run time. And then the fifth one is underlying CPU usage because we provide a software based solutions. And about all of this, think about video has a large variety content nowadays. So for our AI, the first thing you can think of, and we have been also doing this, is we have a content adaptive AI compression. So for example, now I'm sitting in front of a computer, there's a natural videos collected. And then if we start to share the screen, like for example, we may have some virtual background, that's computer generated content. So all these content are different. Like AV1, the new standard, they have special tools to handle screen content. That set of tools referred to as screen content tools. So you have different content, you can use different tools. If you use AI to differentiate a different type of content at the very early stage, then you can only use specific tools to handle that content you end up really boost up the quality, got more special um, like compression ratio, and at the same time you process it fast with low latency and lower CPU cost. So fundamentally, we like to use AI to have adaptivity included in our video encoder product. So that's mainly what we have been doing. Okay. So how do you charge for your codex and how do you charge for your cloud? Is uh, Why don't you go into that a little bit? Yeah, uh, this is actually two different types, but actually pricing wise, we become more uh, sort of standardized. And at the beginning, we also like uh, when we grow, we have a different type of pricing. And nowadays we become more standardized. So both our um, uh, on-premium, and the cloud service is mainly volume based. So we have unit price, for example, per transcoding uh, video unit. And in terms of minutes, so we have unit price for per, min per, per minute based pricing. And then we actually look at the volume of our customers. 
But of course, because there's a smaller volume, there's a huge volume customer that we're handling. So we also have offered a tiered price for that. So that's mainly our pricing. And then for, for example, for our cloud live, and then we can either, if a customer mainly use our transcoding, of course, it's a volume based on the transcoding meaning, but it is, if they actually start to use our end-to-end -end streaming, so we also have a per channel and per stream type of pricing as well. So, so sometimes also based on the use cases. Okay. And your codex, when you, when you license the codec, it's available as an SDK? Mm hmm Okay. Yes. So we our our encoder, as you mentioned, it can be offered as SDK. So for example, some customer want to take our library to integrate with FMPEG or integrate with the G Streamer or integrate with WebRTC. So it really depends on their own preference. So we all provide the SDK together with the APIs. So that'd be easier for the customer for deployment. And at the same time, our encoder also embedded within our cloud services for both wild and live. Right. Okay, so, so let's talk about some of the individual ways you're utilizing AI. Let's mm -hmm. start with scene, scene classification. Oh. Was, that, was that something you did before you started using AI or was that something that was kind of came into being once you enabled AI? Yeah, I think that's a, that's actually a very good question. I wouldn't say that suddenly AI is being deployed. I think before even, even with the, the older, for example, uh, video always has been clarified for different genres. So there's a sports, outdoors, indoors, and later on, especially under the pandemic, there's a lot of computer generated content. And recently there's a gaming, and then also now we have a new genre like a computer gen AI, completely generated video. So you can look at, let's just take gen AI. So we all know that Sora has been rolled out by open AI. And so you look at that computer generated, it's still different. They, they look so real. However, when you look at that, unless they intentionally doing, they have low noise. They don't have that much noise. And then at the same time, you can see they have a bright color and the contrast is pretty higher than natural videos. So most of the time, the edges are sharpened because many times if you do compression, you may end up with aliasing along those sharpening uh, edges. So you start to like process this kind of video. So look natural but it's actually different from the natural videos, so different from the video that we are being recorded. So less noise, sharpening edges, and when you apply video coding tools, you kind of seeing something somewhere between the natural scenes and the screen content. So somewhere in the middle. In this way, you want to actually identify, for example, if nobody tell you this is a general video, how do we differentiate that? So you want to find some features to detect, wow, this is a kind of that video. So you have genre video, you have sports video, you have outdoor video, you have indoor some content. If at the early stage that you can identify, hey, this is a screen content, let's say, or this is a more computer generated content, like animations, gaming, screen content, and the partial of the gen AIs, you start to know that there's a certain coding tools you have to use. Let's say AV1, there's a special tool you want to use. If you actually identify this kind of thing, you can use a very special tool to that. So that means you make some early station, you can get very many tools. You only for some small sets of tools, you can get a faster speed, but even better quality. So at the beginning, you have a classification task to actually do before you start with any detailed compression. That part is actually AI. But like you mentioned, the video content become a lot more variety than what we were 10 years ago. So this part, we need some more advanced AI technologies to do scene detection. Because 
First, we can have a, like a file based differentiation, but also along the scene, for example, right now we record a natural video, maybe we start to share the screen. So you may want to get a frame by frame type of classification as well. So this is what we mean that the scene detection and classification and leveraging AI because there's a classification type of thing that you want to identify. So did you, did you do this before? you integrated AI into your codex or did you start doing this once you integrated AI? Um, I, I think for our, uh, uh, like Virinola, we actually started from the beginning because we found that if we want to differentiate ourselves, we have to do something at early stage. And uh, if we want to get faster and, and also maintain good compression ratio, you want to make some smart wise decision at early stage. So we start to actually looking for there's a some classification we can do on the early stage or tiers. You can do like a whole content based and then you can also do frame based and even you can do like a region based differentiator. So our framework was there from the beginning, but it's just with the development of our product and with the world are transforming, we actually start to adding more AI factors to our product and technologies. So did, it, did AI add features to that or did it just make you better at it? Well, I would say um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a just a, it's a, it definitely has some feature and then, but it's more of, I think is, uh, it's really data-based because we found that, for example, uh, we rely on two types of data because right now, um, I, I think uh, you already heard like from our um, publication post that we mentioned, we have more than a hundred customers that have been launched and on top of it, have working with uh, many different content. On the other side, there's a lot of content that are back publicly available. Like for user category content, YouTube has a lot of data that's publicly available. And premium content, Netflix also have a lot of content that's available. And recently, when this AI comes, I we believe down the road, there's maybe a lot more content that is available. So the more content we actually work with our customer, because we have only one product. For example, we have one product for anyone one product encoder for HEVC, one for AVC. And, but when this code encoder working with more content is actually, we found the AI gave us the advantage that it can start to adapt more variety of content. Sometimes they always say, oh, this video doesn't work. And then we start to look into why it doesn't work. And then when we make it work, it's actually going back to the same encoder code base. So this is actually how AI help us because you start to learning and training, you get the encoder get better. It can actually start to differentiate um, for different scenes and different content and different scenarios. So I would say that answer your question, yes. From the very beginning, we have this framework and along the way, and then because of this framework, when we get more content, and our encoder get better. Okay. Do you have any sense of how much better this particular feature, major codec with a major codec, better with the AI component? Is it five percent uh, better, ten percent better? Yeah. yeah, I think this is a this is a very question because uh, it's really the encoder for different content, for different scenario, different speed levels, with different even keyframe interval could be performed different. But I want to give one example because people do ask, uh, uh, how do you use AI for compression for encoding? And then there's an open source encoder called LibAOM. That was a project I worked before by like Apple. So it's an AV1 open source encoder. So I always recommend it that you download that open source, search for neural network. There's two keywords for the commit, because every time you have a commit to the code base for the commit messages, and you will be able to see that what kind of neural network AIs uh, in that code base and easily you can turn on and turn off and to see that what that part of new network will give you the gain. So they gave gains not only for compression, they also gave gains for encoder speed up. 
then everybody can direct the sense how much AI actually benefiting right now the video compression world. Okay. So when you compare, I guess you compare your AV1 codec to, is it SVT or to, or to LibAOM? You know, <laughs> when you look at comparing your codec to the open source equivalent in FFmpeg, what percentage increase in compression efficiency are you, are you getting? Yeah, that's a, that's another, I would say, usually, uh, first I want to say that all this open source, we want to say, we always actually really appreciate it because we still uh, contribute to open source. For example, you look at LibreM, we actually not only my name, because I was previously working on that, but it's also our team also contribute. And even sometimes we found, uh, especially at, because this is code base already become more mature, early stage we found bugs, we also report. And then, so we also always mention, we appreciate the open source community because uh, they are, they are available. You can always learn from them. So we always actually standing on top of the shoulders of the giants for the climbing up. That's what I've been doing. And uh, this is only uh, from our existing customers because their feedback is what we learned. And the same encoder always mentioned working on different scenarios, different content, different speed level, different CPU constraint, will, different latency will give you a different percentage bit rate savings. So usually we try to get like somewhere between 30 to 50% bit rate better. And then sometimes it's hard. For example, the customer said, we want to leverage your encoder actually on a very slim, like IoT devices, CPU is limited. And uh, in that part, what you can do is limited. So we look at a general overall performance. So not only we want to be better, like smaller sets, like say you save 20, 30, or even 50% file size reduction. More we want to look at is, uh, can you actually really lower the CPU usage? Because nowadays, if even customer has a big server, like the 32, 64, 96, or even 128 core machine, they want to always use this one machine to run multiple resolution and bit realigners. So the, we always mention our, we have a, like a sweet spot for our encoder. Our encoder usually run really well for one core, two core, four, at most the eight cores. We are not that good at 16 core at this stage. The problem is not because we have been, we are not capable because we have not collected such requests from the customer. So customers always say that even on the big machines, like having so many cores, we want you to have the density rather than using one, uh, like a big machine only encode one strip. They want to use a multi strip. I'm only here talking about up to HD. Of course, when you talk about the 4K or even 8K, you need more cores. But in the real world, the most common cases, uh, even for 4K, the customer still want to say, hey, I have a 16 core machine. Can you run two 4K encoding at the same time? So we want to actually leverage all these things, uh, encoding speed, encoding CPU usage, as well as the latency, together facilitating the BD rate, meaning that how much you can get better quality and a smaller size. This is what we have been consistently uh, chasing after. So what's the typical uh, value add that customers are coming to you for? Is it CPU? Is it quality? Uh, that's also, uh, so typical, you actually already mentioned too. So, uh, for example, and uh, I believe uh, you may ask. Uh, for example, we have one customer huddle, H U D L. They are actually right now the leading uh, sports video analytics cloud platform, and then we really appreciate collaboration with them. So they got a blog talking about us. If you search Virinola huddle, and then that blog should pump out. They are actually looking at. Actually, two things exactly you just mentioned. So they looking at the quality for sure. They actually in that blog mentioned both objective quality as well as subjective quality. Because eventually, right now, there's only two type of video consuming and users. One is human eyes. We all watch video and we like to have subjective boots up. 
and there's a special video compression right now is the eventual video is not consumed by human eyes but by machines because the machine take that for machine learning task so there's right now there's also a new category video compression for machines mm -hmm. so here we're talking about for human eyes subjective quality so they mentioned that for example for sports so sports what is more important subjective quality wise you care about the players faces you care about the players jersey numbers and this one part that usually actually uh, be ignored sometimes by video compression is the background. So people always think, oh, we need to think about foreground very important, background not important. However, in sports, the background, like the medals, the field are very important. So there they mentioned that how they evaluate different encoders by justifying this important subjective quality features. That in that, and on the other side, they care about CPUs because a customer like that, they actually deploy their whole platform in the cloud and then they have to think about what the cost so for their cost is first is the cpu cost then they also have a great cdn cost so that's why they care about higher quality and lower bit rate however they have a huge volume so many volume they have to do transcoding and then they are not like netflix movies so movie can be watched by millions tens of millions of users their video are not viewed that many times because they're mainly precise like high school football teams so you won't have that many viewers but they have a huge volume so at the really peak time they said that their peak uploading volume per unit time surpass that uploading to youtube so you have a huge amount of your video that you want to do transcoding then cpu is huge so everybody talk about green and then so they want to keep the flexibility so they deploy um software encoder like us on the cloud they want to say how many like uh, um so they actually create a new so how many cores you actually pro uh that you pro you actually process the transcoding task so they actually in that blog they actually create a term that we use a lot they call the poor cpu efficiency so for example every cpu core and at a certain amount of time how many transcoding uh, tasks you can finish so this is what they care exactly i just mentioned cpu quality they care uh, i just use that example okay one of the things we talked about before we started recording was uh you are you say that you are reducing cpu utilization and increasing compression efficiency using ai but most of us including myself associate ai processing with you know buying a bunch of gpus from nvidia which is why the stock price is going out the roof so how can you do that i mean how can you use ai that's rendered you know at the compression stage and reduce cpu utilization at the same time yeah that's actually a very relevant question you asked so we have to say that is uh we are doing software so we do have a uh, sort of a two type of ais so we have a completely cpu based and now we right now also during the especially past few years we also got gpu version the reason we have been right now mainly for some cpu usage because it is available everywhere and then if you have a gpu version customer will come to your a um even in the cloud that they actually rent from the cloud providers, they may only focus on the CPUs. Or sometimes they actually deploy our encoder in their on-premium servers, which do not have GPU available. So also our encoder not only can be deployed on the server side, it also can be deployed on the edge side on end devices like laptop and even phones so we have our encoder delivered for supporting all linux version windows mac os android and ios so we want to make sure that it can be uh, actually deployed everywhere so the mainly we support x86 and arm for cpu this is actually we just want our encoder to be available not just only when the GPU is available, we can be deployed. We want it to actually be widely deployed. So we have the uh, CPU-based AI. Answer your question, when we talk about AI, so 
new networks is actually fundamental tools that we actually leverage. So you can think of there's a huge new network. So like my husband just started to actually test on the Tesla, uh, the new uh, autonomous uh, driving, uh, self-driving feature is the software. And they announced that it's a huge amount of new network like open AI is an LLM, it has, it has like tens of billions uh, trams down there. So those are the AIs, but you can also have the traditional network. For example, if you download, like I just mentioned, LibreM that everyone open source new network um, included encoder, that new network is very small. Hidden layers could be just one, two or three. And the nodes could be only 100 to 200, 500 nodes down there. So it's just small things down there that being leveraged and definitely sometimes the equivalent to a matrix, uh, matrix based calculations, linear algebra down there. So CPU is good at use that. Answer your question, when you leverage this kind of AI new network, you don't consume that much CPU power, but you actually include the depth adaptation inside it. Let's say somebody start to like increase, uh, yeah, compress our like recorded video. So you can see that we don't move that much. Of course, you can use a traditional motion as mission, but you can see that there's something very similar. So then originally inside the encoder, there's a lot of hard coded, coded thing. They also have if else. So now you have a new network, you don't have to do this manually, different code paths, different things. You can just say, I have new network, it will let me know for the current scene, what kind of block size is. Should I use eight by eight block or should I use sitting by sitting block? And then transform, should I use this disco source and transform or I can also use another different type of transform. So this is a learning thing, adaptation that you can be further enhanced by using new network into your core encoder decisions. So this is part of AI, it's a light AI, but it's actually gave you the smarter decision to make sure you really leverage the limited number of bits to get even better quality. And also, as we just mentioned, you can get a pre-analysis down there. Say, oh, this is a face-based. That is actually screen content-based. So you can use that for classification. Immediately you can say, oh, we already process a face-based with this set of parameters, this set of scheme. So now it's actually face-based. So then we actually just directly deploy that kind of configuration and approach to encode these things. We actually do not have to go down the other path. This kind of AI-based decision also help you to make very smart decisions at the beginning, and then you actually only deploy a subset of the optimization scheme down there. So you get faster using low CPU usage, but you still be able to get optimal solutions to guide the compression. So this kind of things, that you can actually leverage the CPU resources. You don't have to rely on the GPU. So how many of those decisions within your, say your H.264 codec are driven by a neural network? I mean, how many real AI components are there in your H.264? I mean, is it five, is it a thousand? You know, do you have a sense of that? Uh... Well, it's actually quite a bit, but I don't think it's a, it really depends on what you mean with a, a thousand. So we would say that it doesn't have that much. Uh, like, uh, this is very hard. Uh, it's just uh, to say that because uh, there's some pre trained and then when you really do the encoding is actually already have, uh, like within the past, there's already some different layers. So you have, uh, like I mentioned, you have uh, the content, the whole content based of decision. And then, for example, even for uh, longer movies, you may have a two hour, then you can actually chunk them to five minutes. So we people always use that the segment of stitch. And then you sometimes when you actually process a very short video, like say Pinterest, they mainly have um, like somewhere between several seconds to like 10 to 20 seconds. So all these actually are different processing, 
And then, so you could actually sometimes look at the whole content where you actually can sample from different. So there's a whole video level, and then you go down frame level, and you can go down slice level, go down block level. I would say if you just look at these levels for RDOs, this is just where you can use some new network based. And inside that, they, uh, and then you decide whether you want to use intro or inter. This is go down to really detailed tools. So when you look at the layers, you don't have the thousands kind of AI decision that you have to use. Um, it's mainly that there's some, I would say, we do encoding, there's nothing that is magic. It's just that we care about the details. So for example, even for human faces, how do you process it? If you have a very, very large amount of bits, so you look at a higher bit rate, and then the faces, you have to put a very good, like about the, the texture, like the hair. And then when you go down the lower bit rate, you actually will pay sometimes the higher texture takes a lot of bits. But in the smaller resolution, it's not so obvious to human eyes. So here you can actually use some, I would say, aggressive compression on this kind of area. You can even use some blur to actually making those high edges to become uh, like kind of like a high pass filter. And then the, you actually can put lower bit rate into that, but in that smaller resolution, lower bit rate cases, it doesn't matter that much. So you can think of that different use cases, different bit rate letters. You may want to treat the same content if you identify this is a faces with hair differently. So this is a maybe there's something that can different with what we have been doing. We really care about different scenarios. Even I would say once Hado, they gave us a problem. They said that there's a basketball player that actually dribbled the balls and they see some kind of ghosting effect along the face edges. And then when, when we look at the problem, it's basically the problem is very simple. We just uh, should have put more bits in that in that scene. If you have more bits, everything has been resolved. But how do you know that you have to put bits in that specific scene? So this is what we actually start to look at it is because the motion somewhere in the between, if the motion really slow, you can detect that motion and you get good motion transmission. If the motion is really fast, you can actually use the motion as a masking. You, you still do not need that many bits. But it's just somewhere in the between the human eyes will notify that. And then at that time, you have put a little bit more bits so that it won't disturb the human eye subject quality. So that's what we did. And then we put a little bit more adaptive in that and to include that factor. So that's what we have been doing. Okay. When you talk about 30 to 50% better than open source, is that measured with uh, subjective? Or is that measured with an objective metric like VMAP or PSNR or SSIM? Uh, in general, we actually really depends on the customer preference. So you actually bring up a question about quality metrics. So ideally, uh, we always like the customer to look at subject to quality and many of our customers do and that they care about because that's eventually really care um, uh, this is a user experience, right? So you want our customer mainly we do B two B, and they have their own ad users. So if ad users start to like the quality, they start to watch videos more. And then when you have a longer time, you have more engagement. You can do a lot of other business like ads or some other things. And then, but it's also tricky. So I give you one example. Let's compare SDR and HDR. Just the example, it doesn't mean let's come back the quality metric. So many times the human eyes like HDR, they have great quality. You think that quality is good. However, let's think uh, this is actually we got the feedback from our customer. When people like to uh, start to watch their video, either in bed 
before they go to bed or then we wake up. The first thing is, oh, I want to get the video and then start to look at. So usually it's still the environment dark. Maybe you just uh, didn't, was lazy to turn on the light or it's actually that someone shared the bed that you don't want to disturb others. So at this time, the humans look at the screen. Let's say the short video, you start to actually scrap, you start to look at the video and suddenly you may see an HDR video out of all the SDRs. So HDR usually brighter than SDRs. However, in that dark environment, when you start to suddenly look at a HDR from the past SDR, it actually starts to tear in your eyes because it gives you a sudden brighter experience, even though it looks nicer. So we know that some customers, they actually specifically turn off the HDR delivery during the night time. They try to detect what is the time because when you suddenly become tearing, of course you stop watching. So what I meant is uh, how do you differentiate the quality at that time? It does have a better quality, but the humans don't like that. So the quality justification is actually tricky. We actually use all these kind of metrics because some customers told us uh, they like PSNR traditional because they think this is a way that is a fair for all the encoders. And someone, they actually prefer VMAP. We still actually got more and more people like VMAP because they think at least VMAP is uh, consistent, most likely with uh, human eye justification, but then uh, there's uh, something they say, oh, you can actually got some method to trick VMAP. So then VMAP NAG now become more popular. It really depends, but some customers, they like ICM, some customers have their own metric. So we are all okay. And we all know that this is a, there is a dedicated ma uh, metric uh, company like SMware. They have the SSM Plus, SM Wave. So this is all have been using different quality metrics. And then for us, we actually okay. Of course, I have to say, if you have a specific metric, you can actually do specific things. You may do good under uh, PSNR SM could be at the same bad or not as good as VMAF. So sometimes you have to say, okay, SM, VMAF and the PSNR and maybe some other metric all there and then you get the performance. It could be really different very savings. So for us, we don't have a strong preference. We listen to the customers. Okay. So what, what do you have on your website from customers or what do you have out there that have customer measurements of the savings that you've been providing? Are there any, you know, if, if I wanted to go look those up, would mm -hmm. I be able to confirm the 50% number or the 30% number you're talking about? I think, yeah, this is that we have a case study that we have also, we try not to be too many data down there, but you'll be able to see that um, that data is right there. Also, when we compare the some uh, baseline, if that is open source, we usually just also provide a command options. So, so that we make sure that baseline can be simulated for whoever be interested. What would you say the improvement to your compression efficiency has AI delivered to date? Is it 5%? Is it 20%? What's your sense? I would say every single of delivery already have AI that they are more or less because we already uh, propagate that and we found that that's quite effective. And then as I mentioned that you can use AI as a very simple way and then you can learn that from that LibreM code base. You need some new network is actually really uh, applicable. And then, but there's also special cases because we also have a GPU based. And then there's a customer that needs, they have a GPUs and then they actually want to the GPU resource because the GPU definitely provide a lot of AI. You can train a very good model, more complicated. And we right now also, because we do compression and on top of that, we also have our enhancer. So enhancer can always be coupled with compression. For example, you can actually compress more, but on the player side, 
you add things back. This is an enhancer. So even right now in the ARM devices, like iOS devices, they already have the NPU unit that you can leverage. When you leverage that, you actually got more AI capabilities. Actually, there's always a tricky on the device side because people care about quality, but they more care about the battery life. So you only you actually do not consume that much battery life. And at the same time, you get better quality, that ideal. However, this contradict. But sometimes the NPU works. You, you actually leverage those new hardware. They actually give you more AI. You don't have to consume that much battery life, that much power, and you get even better quality. So we yeah, I, I, I yeah. guess there was a time where you didn't have AI, and now you have AI. What's, yes, the, difference, right. what's the difference in compression efficiency? Uh, if you look at the GPUs, is no, it definitely all, all other things being equal? What's what's the you know what's the, what's the difference in compression efficiency? What has AI added to your to your uh, codecs in, in terms of that performance? Um, it definitely added quite a bit. First, we want to mention, for example, VMAF. If the customer uses VMAF or VMAF, that we know know that VMAF is a learning based quality metric. So I gave you one example. Originally, we all talk about like premium kind of like a movie compression. At that time, we know compression is meaning, meaning, meaning the information loss. So when you talk about information loss, it means that encoded result video is all, never be better than the source video. So this is one thing. However, when we start to look at like YouTube, right? The video upload to the YouTube, those user generated content, it could be blurred. It could be noisy. And then at this time, what if it's very noisy at the source and you just remove some of the noise and you do the encoding? So the encoded video is actually have less noise to human eyes. After you compress, you don't lose things. You actually gain things because you look at the encoded video even nicer than the original one. But if you use a PSNR, you won't get a good result because the PSNR is calculated the number, the difference between the pixel values. You actually definitely lost more because originally noise is there, now it's gone. So you get lower PSNR, but you start to calculate VMAF, you actually do get better result because it's a more consistent with the human justifications. So I would say because of this AI based metrics that have been developed, that actually leading the compression to actually have better result, more savings. This is also because nowadays there's many generated content from users, not from premiums. So I would say because of the metric, you actually can even get larger compression. This is not just us. This is actually the whole community working on that. So definitely if you use VMAP, you can do more things. If you just look at subject, you can do more things. And then the compression is there. You don't have to do anything. So you can actually compression ratio is ready there. So I would say all of this AI factor definitely gave you a better result. And it's not just a 30, it could be even more. But so I we I we we have been doing things, but this is really we benefit a lot of others. Uh again, we really appreciate this community. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's all I have. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you. All these topics is really just uh, got exciting. Um, thank you for being and also your feedback and your insights shared here. My pleasure. Good to see you. All right. Thank you.